Yeah, hi Kay. Hello, uh, right, welcome everyone. This is uh, Bible Outreach, or Ben, as he's better known, uh, and he comes to Speaker's Corner with us regularly. Um, he knows quite a bit, so I wanted to get to introduce you to him, or him to you even, and to ask him a couple of questions about how he uh, began with his main, um, the target of his main polemicism is Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'd like to ask you, Ben, how did you become interested in that particular uh, cult or section of um, people who believe? Well, I started to um, take an interest in them because whenever you go out of your house, I'm sure you've seen yourself, you're always going to run into a Jehovah's Witness on the corner of a street, under a flyover, or at a bus stop with their literature carts and all their materials. So I decided to learn more about them. I started to read some of their uh, material from their website. I started to read books from ex Jehovah's Witnesses, which I can recommend at the end of the video maybe. Um, so I read some books on Jehovah's Witnesses and then I just started to engage and I started to you know, learn on the go really. I'd speak to them, hear what they believe, and I'd engage with their arguments as I went on from there. And um, Jehovah's Witnesses really, it, it, it's, an, it's an old heresy made new. The heresy really began in the early fourth century with a man called Arian, which is where we get the heresy Arianism, named after the man Arian. And what Arian preached was, he preached that Christ wasn't eternally the second person of the Trinity, but rather he was a created being, God's first act of creation, and then all else was created fr through him which of course goes against what the Bible says. If you read John chapter one, it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And in verse three, it says that the word, Jesus, is the creator of all things. Can I just so ask you, can I just ask you for anybody who's not aware, how do uh, Jehovah's Witnesses get around um, and the word was with God and the word was God. What do they have some sort of facility to be able to quickly try to disprove that? Yeah, well, I, it, it, well, I don't normally when I'm speaking to a Jehovah's Witness themselves I don't normally go to John 1 1 because they have the most rehearsed answer and you can you could argue with them all day about this It's it's because they're, they're dead that they they argue about the definite article in the Greek where it should be there or shouldn't be there and they believe that the in their translation, the the, uh, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. Oh, and so actually, completely separating it out from God. Yes, yes. So that's how they kind of that that would be their response to that. Not God, but a God. When if you look in the Greek, it shouldn't be translated that way. But that's that's. If you that's look in the Old Testament, there is no other God. So, yeah. But anyway, sorry. Carry yeah, on. Yeah. Isaiah forty four. But you're right, there's no other God. Isaiah 43, verse 10, uh, there's no God before me, nor will there be any God after me, God says. So John is, is what John's doing there in John 1 as well, he's, he's kind of drawing from Genesis. In the beginning, God created, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So he's saying in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So I don't tend to bring that up with them because they have a rehearsed answer, almost. Yeah. So um, Arianism basically preached out that Jesus was a created being, the first act of creation, and other things were created through him. So, of course, in the early church, this caused quite a bit of uproar because a lot of the bishops at that time considered Arius what he was preaching was dangerous and um, heretical, really. So, what they done was they, uh, of course, they disagreed. So, Constantine at the time called for a council, and uh, it was held in the place Nicaea. That's where we get yeah, the name council. People have heard of it. Yep, Council of Nicaea in the uh, year 325 AD. What happened at this council, there was around about 1,800 bishops were actually invited to the council to discuss this. But of course, not all of them turned up. They, they say around 300, give or take, to actually turned up to the meeting. So they debated it and um, they heard the issue. And let, let's bear this in mind, some people will say that especially a speaker's corner, we'll hear this argument all the time from, from um, some uninformed Muslims. They'll say that this is where the doctrine of the Trinity was, was founded, which of course isn't true because um, for one, the Council of Nicaea wasn't even about the Trinity. It was about the person of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ the Trinity? Yeah, exactly. So this caused a lot of uproar in the, in the debate itself to the point where St. Nicholas um, 
we when we say I'm on Saint his Nick, good list, by the way. When we say Saint Nick, we often think of uh, Father Christmas, Santa Claus, but the original Saint Nick wasn't a jolly red man with, with a red suit and a white beard handing out presents. He was um, what he what he was a he was a uh, a, a Bible thumping, heretic slapping, council mm. debating bishop. Because what he'd done after hearing this Arian heresy that Arius was speaking about in the council, he basically lost his temper. This was an early church bishop. He stood up in the meeting, walked over across the room and slapped a heretic in the, uh, in, in the So it, this heresy caused a lot of uproar and a lot of issue within the, uh, this, this particular debate. So, um, so yeah, so this debate wasn't about forming the Trinity. It was about the person of Jesus Christ. So when we have people like Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims who will say that this, council, this, that this council is where you guys get the Trinity, it's historically that's not true because we know that the early church before Nicaea also believed in the Trinity. They believed in the deity of Christ and we have that in some early church fathers' writings. So to say well, that... I what I did uh, before we spoke, I had a look for some evidence of these um, early, like pre nicene writings by well-known Christians. And if you've got a second, I'm going to try to share my screen so that I can just read a couple. If that's all right. Let's have a go. All right. I don't know. If you, can you see that? Um, I can. Yeah. So we have Polycarp, who is the year uh, AD 70 to around 155, and he's the Bishop of Smyrna, and he's the disciple of John. And he says, O Lord God Almighty, I bless you and glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved son, through whom be glory to you with him and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Stop, so stop there, one, one, yep. one moment. Notice what Polycarp said there. Um, as, as that says, Polycarp's really important because Polycarp, is a disciple of John the Apostle himself. So yeah. Polycarp is only one person removed from Christ. Yeah. And he's saying, here, notice that part there, through whom be glory to you, with him and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Yeah. Now, yeah. Polycarp was learning from John. John and Polycarp both knew the Old Testament, where the Old Testament says that God will share his glory with no one. But here we have Polycarp saying that the Father, the Son and the Spirit all yeah. share his glory. So clearly Polycarp believed in the deity of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, and then I'll just read a, a couple of more. Uh, Justin Martyr, who I've got a book of his that's really very interesting. Um, we're guessing it looks like that he's the year 100 to about 165. And he was a Christian apologist and martyr is in the name. Um, and he says, for in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then received the washing with water. So that's in one of uh, a, a volume of one of his writings. So that is clearly Trinitarian. Um, and the last one that I'll read out, but everybody can see the um, web link at the top there. Um, the last one I'll read, but there's a, a further list of them, is Ignatius of Antioch, who died. We don't know when he was born, but he died in 98. So only... 65 years after the uh, crucifixion and resurrection. He was a bishop. So he's a bishop in a 60 year old church potentially. And he um, defended Christianity. So he was an apologist and he wrote, in Christ Jesus our Lord, by whom and with whom be glory and power to the Father with the Holy Spirit forever. So what's crucial in that is the by whom and with whom. So glorified along with the Father. And he says, we, all, we have also as a physician, the Lord, our God, Jesus, the Christ, the only begotten son and word before time began, but who afterwards became also man of Mary, the Virgin. For the word was made flesh, being incorporeal. He was in the body, being impassable. He was in a passable body, being immortal. He was in a mortal body, being life. He became subject to corruption that he might free our souls from death and corruption and heal them and might restore them to health when they were diseased with ungodliness and wicked lusts. And that's, as you can see on the screen, it says Alexander Roberts and, Jane, and James Donaldson editions, the Anti-Nicene Fathers. I think I've got that book. I don't remember reading that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a second.
and uh, let you carry on. So after, so where do you think then the the misinformation or the the misconception comes that rather than the divinity of Christ and his personhood within the Trinity was being debated, which we know it was, how do you suppose that translated into modern polemicists arguing that it's literally a creation of Nicaea, this idea of a three-personed, one essence, almighty God? Well, I think the reason why people think Nicaea was the, um, <clears throat> was the place where the Trinity was formed, I think that's basically just it's hearing it's really hearing bad arguments online really that, that, that's where i think that mainly comes from people to regurgitate what they've heard online before um but notice what that said there ignatius polycarp and justin Martyr, especially in ignatius's quote at the very bottom one he was talking about the hypostatic union jesus christ being god and then coming in the flesh that's the hypostatic union the, the, the god man so you know jehovah's witnesses and arius Really, I think they get their view from uh, misunderstanding the Bible in its in its context. Arius and Jehovah's Witnesses teach and taught that um, Jesus was a created being. And I think when I've been discussing with Jehovah's Witnesses, the verse they often bring up is Colossians chapter 1. Where, let me just read it to you. Colossians chapter 1 says this. Bear with me. Yeah. Colossians chapter 1. Talk among yourselves, everybody. I'm joking. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Please. He, this is talking about Christ. Yeah. He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature. So whenever I've discussed with Jehovah's Witnesses about the deity of Christ, Christ being pre-existent, uh, in the word was the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and that yeah. Jesus has been eternally the second person of the Trinity. Jehovah's Witnesses will often come back with, well, no, we know he was created at a particular time because verses like Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, where it calls Christ the firstborn of every creature or the firstborn yeah. over all creation. The problem that they, that they have there is they, they don't understand the context because that word firstborn there doesn't mean the first to be created over all creation. In its context, it's talking about preeminence first in yeah. rank, first over all things. So I often take them to Psalm 89, verse 27, because if they want to say that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, because it uses that word there, firstborn, then in Psalm 89, verse 27, God says about David, he says, I'll make him the firstborn over all the kings of the earth. Now, okay, was David the firstborn of all the kings of the earth? No, and even if God made him so, God's not saying he'll rewind time and have him born first. It, I think it relates to the older brother, younger, like the first born of a family is the most senior member of those children. Important. So, yeah, so if they want to say that the word first born in Colossians has to mean that Christ was the first to be created, then take them to Psalm 89 verse 27 and say, okay, do you believe that David was the firstborn of all the kings of the earth? And they're going to say, well, no, of course not, because he wasn't. He wasn't the first king of the earth, and he wasn't even the firstborn in his family. He was the youngest brother. So the word firstborn in both contexts does not mean literally the first to be created or the first to be born. It's talking about preeminence, first in rank. Also, I guess, I mean, I've had a few conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses before, unfortunately, I fell asleep. No, I'm joking. <laughs> like, literally, I can do a little bit, and then they generally walk away from me. But um, if they knock on the door, they're just, well. But anyway, so what I guess I would ask them is, when they say Christ is the firstborn of our creation, do they mean the word, or do they mean Christ, the man who is God? Because obviously... To, to my mind it doesn't necessarily negate salvation to believe that christ as a man is preeminent above all men because that's man it's just manifestly true he is a perfect man and and god at the same time my other question ah so that's my point to them but they're not here at the moment but what i'd like to ask you or just to uh maybe elaborate on this so that people who are watching who may not realize because not many people seem to um do I know they do, so this is a hypothetical question, um, or a rhetorical even. Do they believe that Christ had a secret identity, that potentially he's some sort of celestial being other than, 
other than the word i just like yeah i wonder yeah, yeah um if you actually go onto the jw website jehovah's witness or jw.org you'll find that stated on their website that they believe that uh the art the archangel michael i know is, is, is the um is the heavenly form of christ if you like that he's it's i mean there's nowhere in the bible that teaches this that he's mm -hmm. michael the archangel in heaven comes down to earth and he's jesus christ right. so it's a really i mean if you you can actually go on the website and they've got a long big article about this and so, so, so really the whole yeah so that in and of itself is a heresy even without the aryan kind of god can't come and die sort of strand of things um yeah where do you suppose they get it from was the guy who started them off just delusion like did he ever give a chain of reasoning as to how he had this alleged divine revelation that is not in the bible that nobody else has ever mentioned well I or how did jw's justify that belief yeah i think it comes from bad exegesis really because when they look at verses in the bible where it talks about the uh, the angel coming with the art look the um the host of heaven the army of heaven type thing and they say you see jesus in revelation for example coming with the with the host of heaven yeah they they yeah. say that it's only you know they can't look at that and say well he's coming with the host of heaven he's also coming with the host of, of heaven so therefore there must be one in the same which of course that logically doesn't follow again yeah. that's actually, that's stated on their website you can you can actually find that on their on their website so what they basically do can i just the, oh, sorry carry on you no. witness. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry, I was interrupting. Go on. Uh, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses really, um, although the heresy, you could take it all the way back to Arius, if they've actually, they have some other, you know, heresy breeds heresy. They've got yeah. some other heresies yeah. too, like um, they, 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 they attack the divinity of Jesus, but they also attack the Holy Spirit. And this all really started off with a man called um, Charles Taze Russell, and then after Charles Taze Russell, you had a second generation who kind of come along and um, really pushed it along. But what they basically teach is that, of course, Christ isn't God. He's created. And he's the first act of creation. So they attack the deity of Christ. But they also attack the, the person of the Holy Spirit. In, within their own Bible, they teach that the Holy Spirit isn't a person. But the Holy Spirit is an active force. God's force on earth, if you like, you know. Um, but the problem is there, I always ask them, okay, if we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit being a, a person or a force, I always, I always tend to take them to Acts chapter five, because even in their own translation of the Bible, they've, they've left enough truth in there to challenge them with it. Because if you give a Jehovah's Witness your literature and you try to give them a book or something like that, I mean, you can try it, but they won't take it. They're, they're, right. they're told not to take your literature. So it's a bit they rude it. when they're giving out their own left, right, and centre. It's a bit ironic. So they won't take your stuff, but they'll want you to take their stuff. So I always ask them, okay, open up your own Bible, Acts chapter five. If the Holy Spirit is an active force, an impersonal being, I always say, can you lie to an impersonal being? Can you lie to an active force? No, you say, you know, you can only lie to a person. It wouldn't make sense to lie to electricity. It wouldn't make sense to lie to running water or the wind or something like that. You can only lie to a personal being. So take them to Acts chapter 5 in their own Bible, where Ananias and Sapphira, they, they lie. They, yeah. they sell some land, keep some back for themselves, give the whole money to Peter and say, this is all of it. Peter says to them, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says in the next verse, you've not lied to man, but to God. So what yeah. Peter says there is lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. So also, how can this be? Sorry, also what I'd point out is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is um, what's known as an eternal sin. So it's uh, not in the list of forgivable uh, sins, which is generally everything, if you've got true repentance and a sincerely repentant heart, yeah. But so I would argue, I guess with them, why would blaspheming um, a non-personal force of nature or force of God be punishable by damnation? Like there's something about the Holy Spirit because, yeah, I just, well, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, but yeah, I'd bring that up. And also I'd bring up the fact that there's not enough room in heaven anyway, apparently, according to, as far as I know, and I'm only a layman when it comes to them, 
but there's only space for 144,000 people anyway. So why are they recruiting? Why don't they just get their numbers up and just call it a day? I don't know. Do you have an well, answer? That, 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 that's something maybe we should do a separate discussion on because that's a whole kind of a big issue. But with, with regards to them attacking the Holy Spirit as well, um, of course, if, if it, the Holy Spirit is an active force, then how can you lie to the Holy Spirit? You can only lie to a personal being, but it also goes against other parts of the Bible. For example, let me read to you John, John 14, verse 26. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, while abiding with you, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, not it, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. How can an active force yeah. teach you anything? How can an active force bring to your remembrance anything? And How can that an active there. force communicate anything to you? Because the Holy Spirit is seen to communicate, like to speak. So Yeah, and no, notice that word there. He will teach you, not it will teach you. Yeah. He will teach you. But there's, there's other verses. You go to Romans chapter 8, verse 27. And he who searches the heart's knows what the mind of the spirit is because he this is the spirit he intercedes for the saints according to the will of god how can he intercede if he's just an active force how can an yeah. active force intercede between us and god? i mean again this goes to acts 13 uh, 13 verse 2 and it says and while they were ministering to the lord and fasting the holy spirit said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Yeah. So we have here the Holy Spirit interceding, yeah. teaching, yeah. and we have the Holy Spirit speaking. And being so referred how, to as God as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So how can that, I mean, especially in Acts 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me. You have the Holy Spirit there speaking to... Directly. To, yeah. Exactly. So how can a person, how can an impersonal force that's not a person communicate with anyone? Of course yeah. it can't. And yeah. the, the issue when you bring this kind of thing up to them, they often, I mean, I, I had a, I had a Jehovah's Witness friend I was meeting for coffee with, with me for coffee, maybe once every other week or so. And we would go through a few different things like the Trinity, Christ and the, um, the Holy Spirit. And whenever I bring these things up to them, it, it, it's difficult to speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. Because you want them to think independently, but they don't always think independently. Yeah. Because whenever he, I got him kind of stuck on a verse, he would open up his phone and he would go onto the jw.org uh, app on his phone. Yeah. He'd, go on, he'd go to the verse in question, he'd tap the verse, and it would literally give them an explanation of what to say. And this is a verse, this is an app he had on his phone. So he would literally just read this, and, and, and even if it didn't make a lick of sense, he'd yeah. read it and say, well, that's what it means. So it's, it's, I said to him, listen, I want you to think independently apart from the app. Take the app away. Let's, let's, let's forget the app and let's look at what the text actually says. Yeah. Because a number of times he would, um, he, he would often bring up verses in the Bible and um, really with no backing, he'd have his app on his phone. This is what it says. Therefore, that's what it means. Yeah. One, one, one example was um, he, he said that he believes that the return of Christ, the second coming, has already happened. So he said, it's already happened. And I said, really? He said, yeah, it's when already happened. When was the happened. tribulation? When was I, the rapture? Why are we I, all still here? Yeah, I, I said to him, so then why did none of us see it? And he said, well, it was an invisible coming. You will said, see okay. him coming in clouds of glory. You're, you're exactly right. Let's just go there. And this, this is what I've done. When he said this, I said, okay, that's interesting. Let's turn to, um, let's turn to um, Matthew 24. Excuse me, uh, is it 24? Might be 25. Whilst you're yeah, looking, I just want 24. to say that, that Jehovah's Witnesses may be slightly encouraged by the corona lockdown because um, they know everybody's home. So Yeah, so yeah, Matthew 24. Jesus says in his own words, <clears throat> this, then the sign, and this is where I took him to, during our conversation. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see, this, this bear in mind, all the tribes of the earth 
And yeah. then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. Yeah. So I said to him, okay, did you see that happen? And he had to say, well, no, it is invisible. I said, okay, you're saying, you're, you're saying that this was an invisible coming in the year 1918 or 1925, 1914, one of them. Oh, he had a date and everything when everybody missed it. How did yeah, you know he, the date then? It was one of, those, one of those three dates. But he said um, it happened invisibly back then. I said, but now let's, I said, I basically said to him, how do you square that circle? Because Christ, in his own words, yeah. said that everyone's going to see it, not a select group of individuals in yeah. the Watchtower and Track Society. And again, is that why they're in a watchtower? Because they're looking like they want to see it first. Because I, I, I said to him, the, the man's name was Doug. I said, Doug, look, what you have there is you have a false prophecy. You have the watchtower saying that the Jehovah's Witness, the, the second coming of Christ happens, it's invisible, and not everybody saw it. You have the words of Christ in Matthew 24 saying that all eyes will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. So everyone's going to see it. I said that's called a false prophecy on the part of your organize on the part of your uh, religious organization. I said, what did Moses say about false prophets? Mm. I said, Moses said, if, if anyone speaks you know, presumptuously in the name of the Lord, they are to be stoned to death. I said, your Watchtower and Track Society should be stoned to death according to Old Testament law. Yeah. So they, they, they or just know. cursed by God according to the New Testament, and we we yeah. can forego the Monty Python, but he said Jehovah. Like, let's not go there, but. Yeah, definitely yeah. A, a stern talking to. Yeah. So they, they do many things like that. They, they, they often twist what the Bible says. But I would say if you're going to speak to them, look into their own translation. Have, the translation of, have their translation on your phone or something like that. Because if, if you read the NASB or something like this, the ESV, they're not going to take it serious. If you try to give them a book, they're not going to take it serious. In fact, well, I suppose they, they feel the same way about every other translation as... I do about their translation. I don't, the bits of it that match up with mine, but I've always got mine with me. I wouldn't dream of listening to their rendition of any verse, to be frank, because as we know, one letter, one comma, one, you, do you know what I mean? Like one capital letter as opposed to a, a little G and not a big, like it can all be read into so, so quickly and so with just such horrendous results. But I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I did have a couple more questions, but I, I know we're going to get to some uh, further episodes or further chats, so I'll, I'll be sure to write them down. And um, thanks very much for speaking to us today. Oh, and by the way, everybody, Ben's channel is Bible Outreach. That's on YouTube. Literally easy to find, unlike mine. So just type in the two words with a space in the middle and you'll find it and you'll be able to subscribe. All right. Thanks very much, Ben. Okay. Right. Take care.